Okay. All right, how are you? Good? Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> How's your brain so far? Like, you know, like first day, like functional programming, like distributed computing, concurrency. I think, I think my brain already exploded like two, three times. And uh, just preparing for this talk already exploded two, three times. So, but I think it should be okay compared to, you know, all these like th other stuff. Okay, and uh, so my name is Makoto. Uh, I'm a web developer, a company called New Bamboo, based in UK. Uh, so I'm I'm like Rails developer, like probably most of you guys. And but at the same time, for last uh, one year and a half, I spent yeah year and a half uh, translating a book called the DRuby book, uh, which original original book is this one, and uh, so translated and uh, now from uh, Prague Pub, and uh, yeah, and also yeah some people wrote like a. Uh, a nice book review, and the, actually the title, Rails. Uh, previous talk, uh, Davey did like a D versus event machine, but it was actually with RabbitMQ. Uh, this, and then she said it's a bit misleading, but I was even more misleading because even though we say Rails is a follower, this is the only time the word Rails comes. And <laughs> we didn't even say this one, like, you know, we are kind of shy. It's actually all, uh, you have to blame to Matt because in the foreword of this book, he said, like, you know, Rails is a follower. They just follow D Ruby, so uh, yeah, just way much. Okay, <laughs> and uh, so here uh, there's Masato Seki, I call Seki Sam, and he's known for Ruby Committer, and also so the author of uh, D Ruby, which is a talk, main talk, talk topic about this talk, and also probably less known, but there's one called Rinda, which is a distribute. <laughs> Uh, okay. So Rinda is a, a distributed tuple space, uh, which is awesome, but we don't go uh, through detail today. And also, more, uh, probably pe more people know about actually the ERB, and he actually is actually the author of ERB. And also, the le even lesser known fact is he's a Pokemon master, and he had a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2010 uh, Tochigi Prefecture local champion, and uh, he's not even a senior league because senior league in Pokemon is, means like uh, 15 to 18, so he's in a master league champion. Yeah. Be afraid. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> kite kudasai. So, kinai ni mada. Hi. Okay. So uh, during day job, he works at. Uh, company who makes a medical system, and he's actually a Ruby developer. And uh, this is one of the examples of what he, his software is. And it's like highly embedded, and also he, ha he sends a like, real-time uh, <coughs> patient information, and uh, it's lots of network uh, programming involved, and uh, also lots of the GUI programming is involved. So uh, when I talked to, uh, oops, yeah, I talked about the kind of latest Hotness about like you know Node.js, Eventy, and then when I talked that to Sekisan, he said, "Well, I've been doing that for 20 years using C, so that's how he's master." And also, he's kind of big deal in Japan, and <laughs> so that because he's been talking about, uh, he's a regular uh, speaker in the Ruby Kai since 2006. That's like 2006 is when Ruby Kai started. So he's, I think. Except Matt, probably one, one of a few people who just keeps talking about DRuby and the ERB for the last four or five years. And uh, yeah, so this is kind of history of Sexton. And uh, so the blue is a kind of, I call it BD, uh, before DRuby. And the orange is kind of after uh, DRuby, so AD. And uh, the book was published in 2005, but it took about five, six years to get translated because there's no one else to translate until I came in 2010. But, because that time like, he had uh, lots of things to talk about. So we did a uh, lot of uh, brainstorming and how to introduce a new concept. So it's actually a very, very uh, new book. So, and uh, actually, I think, yeah, there's a, yeah. Okay, and uh, so before we start, we'd like to thank you to uh, Ruby no Kai and also New Bamboo for both uh, sponsoring our flight and accommodation. So thank you to Ruby no Kai. <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to talk about three things. Uh, what is DRuby? Uh, <coughs> so who's ever used DRuby before? Okay, 30, 40%. Uh, who's in the last session of Davy's session? 
Okay. And uh, so who has used Ru DRuby before but switched to event machine or celluloid? Or? Okay, there's no one. Oh, praised. Okay, so who has the original DRuby Japanese book? Oh, wow, it's very popular. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> do you have English book as well? Good. Oh, yeah, you reviewed. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, because there's lots of content, so, you know, you should buy. And, oh, yeah, there's a 40% off coupon. It's RubyConf 2012. So, you know, now is a ch limited chance to buy the book. Okay, anyway, so first of all, we're going to, even though, like, some people might already know DRuby, I, I'll explain what, what DRuby is all about. And after that, uh, I'll pass the mic to Seki-san. So, like, he will talk about kind of background of, like, uh, the ways to go to start designing about DRuby. Then he's going to talk about the, all the designing concept, and this is where he's going to introduce some of the metaprogramming concept. And after, if we have a, a time left, we'll do a bit of Q and A. Uh, yeah, okay. So now, Sekisan. Oh, no, that's me, sorry. <laughs> it's still me. Yeah. So why is DRuby? Uh, this, DRuby stands for uh, Distributed Object System, and uh, so what that means is when there are multiple processes, uh, one process can invoke method in uh, different processes. And it's not only that, uh, you can actually get the remote object and you can pass the remote object as a like argument of, to send invoke method or you can return the remote object as a return value. And uh, more importantly, it's like 100% written in uh, Ruby. So there's no C extension or anything. And uh, also, it's part of the Ruby standard library. So probably like 100% of you, if you are a Ruby developer and you have Ruby installed, you actually do have the Ruby. So today, we'll talk, go through some of the uh, source code. And if you, you are interested, please feel free to open the you know, source code and just examine by yourself. And uh, this is a demo. So there's a, a two IRB sessions. I'll call top one as a, a terminal one. And, uh, Bottom one as uh, terminal two. And uh, I don't know how to stop this video. Oh, okay, I cannot stop this video. So <laughs> it says like it, uh, it passes two arguments. One is the URI, and the second is the object you go, want to expose to the DRuby. And in this case, five DRuby, and you expose hash. So hence, if you do DRB front, you see the hash. And if you go to the bottom one, it's called uh, Terminal two. You also rate, uh, start as a star service, but you don't. At this moment, you don't put your own URI. And uh, when you want to connect to terminal one, uh, you do a DRB object new with URI, and you pass the URI of the terminal one. And you can see like that KVS variable actually has a hash, uh, which is exposed through terminal one. And if you put the uh, greeting hello world, you can actually see from. Uh, you know, even though you put in terminal two, you can put in, uh, you can see in terminal one. So this is a very very basic of uh, the Ruby and the demo two. So then, what happens if from terminal two, let's send like standard output of the terminal two? They it, it kind of sends I/O object. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Then let's go see terminal one. Uh, yeah, and if you see, yeah, you can actually. Oh, okay. You, you can send an IO object, but you actually, if you see very carefully, like if you see DRB class method, it's actually replaced by the one called DRB object. So it's kind of reference object. It's not, it really didn't pass the IO object of terminal two. So when, from terminal one, if you do puts, it's actually referencing back to the terminal two, and it, they're kind of grabbing the standard out of the terminal two and doing hello again, okay? Ah, so, yeah, the takeaway from this one is, so I keep saying, like, you know, oh, this is server and the client, but this example actually shows uh, both servers. A uh, one point one is server, terminal one is server, but at the same time, terminal two is server. Okay? That's very important. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, so, and the third one is a distributed queue. Uh, it sounds like, you know, complex, but all you do is, like, in Ruby, there's a, a class called Q, which is, is a bit like array, which has like a push and pop method. So if you put the Q object into the, the, the hash, and uh, wait a second. Yeah, still moving. 
And if you take the queue on terminal 2, and, and if you try to push the value to the queue uh, from terminal 2, you, can, you should be able to pop it from terminal 1. That almost looks like an array. But however, what happens if you try to pop from terminal 1 when there's nothing in the queue? Then it actually waits until something gets put. So let's see at the terminal 2. If you do push 200, that's the moment we, it kind of releases and it shows uh, the result. So let's try it again. It, it holds, it waits. Then it pushes. So. One thing important is even though distributed process, what you mean is like you have multiple processes and they're talking to each other. As a server of each process, it actually doing the multi-threading. And the interesting thing is if this is a single monothread, if you do the pop in terminal one and the waiting, you shouldn't be able to receive the push from terminal two because there's two, two going on. But because of multi-threading, uh, it works. Is this the right explanation? <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> I got approval from another master. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, for the practical example, uh, Davey already talked in the previous session, but another, also another example is he, uh, is he there? Okay, yeah. It's Murakeng, and uh, he works at a company called Cookpa in Japan. It's one of the biggest uh, uh, recipe sharing site, and uh, they had a huge code base, and uh, to run the uh, RSpec, it takes ages. So what they do is like they use uh, DRuby and the Rinda, which is a distributed tuple space to schedule the uh, RSpec. Is it what you do? Yeah, okay, so it's great. So uh, yeah, and there's a, if you go to slide deck, there's a slide of his talk. He did it at Sapporo Ruby Kagi, but uh, Murake is right there taking photo of us, so you can feel free to ask him. Okay, and another example is, Actually, David already explained that, like, you know, kind of starting point and the prototyping. So you start from DRuby because DRuby is pretty much everything to expose things. So you can put like any data structure. You can put like array or queue or uh, set or like tree or RB tree or any like you can use as a graph database or document database or key value store. Pretty much anything. And then once you figure out this is a, exactly the domain problem you want. Then you can move on to a right solution, just like David did for the moving to RabbitMQ, even though some of the things I could say you can use it with Rinda. But <laughs> anyway, and also this is also he did a blank cook. He's a former CTO of the Twitter. He also came, went to the same way. He eventually released uh, his own messaging queue called Starling. But before that, uh, he, I had a, he used a DRuby, so I kind of stalked him and I said, are you sure you really use DRuby? And this is the response says, yeah, I actually used it. Okay, so that's what DRuby is. And that, next, I'll hand over to uh, Master Sexton. And the left is actually me, and the right is Sexton. <laughs> that's my drawing, by the way. <laughs> Hi. Makoto <laughs> meta programmed by me using this script. <laughs> I read it. I've been professionally programming for almost 20 years. At first, I was used to old style Unix programming. The examples of IPC, ah, sorry. <laughs> it, it's a style to connect small processes by IPC, interprocess communication. The examples of IPC are fork and pipe and also, a Unix system, System 5, had an API for message queues, shared memories, and semaphore. Then, I met the web in the mid-90s and learned CJ programming. At that time, it was common practice to use CJ for web programming. It was fun to bring the simplicity of HTTP into network programming. I rewrote some of network programming in CGI. I was surprised that 
I was able to use a higher level language like Perl, which is not surprising anymore. BD1. <laughs> then I met Ruby. That was end of 19th, I met Ruby and the web ser server written in Ruby. It's called HTTP server written by Shinshiro Hara. Hara's server is a lot older than Webrick. It, it was a very small server and easy to tweak. I used to put ELB server on it. I was initially extending features on the web server, but that eventually changed. Instead, I started embedding in web server in the applications. This was similar to IPC style programming, where each application had an HTTP endpoint. There was also another change to my programming style. I started writing everything in Ruby with hard server rather than using various language and connecting them via CGI. Then I realized that my programming style is not so cool anymore. This is because I had to translate Ruby's classes and methods into the web. For example, HTTP restricts the way you exchange objects. The server client model restricts you to one-way communication. I cannot get remote objects to call each other like with Ruby objects in the same process. You also spend time trying to come up with the cool URLs, but that's not the core of your application. I'm not happy with this approach. It's not so liberating to communicate via the web, even when the same Ruby processes are talking to each other. Isn't using web to generalize to when Ruby processes when to talk to each other. This was about that time. I was getting used to programming in Ruby. So I wanted to solve that, this frustration by myself. I want to write a very language-centric solution. I decided to write distributed objects that act like Ruby. I don't want to declare interfaces nor specify declarations in arguments nor in return values. Method, method invocation in Ruby looks like message passing rather than function calls. Maybe I can override the me message passing mechanism and extend Ruby without application Patients noticing it. What we need is a proxy object that acts exactly, Ruby, exactly like Ruby and the server that handles the proxy. The gist of this system, which is DRuby, is to create fake Ruby objects. Next, I will introduce some of the techniques I used to implement DRuby. The first ingredient is method missing. Method missing is invoked if an object receives unknown method calls. You can use method missing to hook in when someone calls remote objects via proxy. Let's see how it works. This is the first implementation of DRuby from back in 1999. DRuby object is a proxy object. Method machine catches a message and its arguments, then transfers them 
to the remote object to evaluate. Next is Marshall. Marshall is a library to serialize Ruby objects. This example shows that DRB protocol object dumps arguments and returns values using the dump method. However, that is a pro there is a, a problem with this approach. Ruby cannot share file nor thread objects, so it raises exceptions. Let me explain how DRB solved this problem. If Ruby cannot share the, um, an object, it converts the object into a proxy object, then shares the proxy. Instead of sending the object itself, DLB sends the reference of the object you want to send. This is how you implement the logic. When master dump fails, then DLB calls the object with DLB object new, then dumps it again. Isn't it cool? Next is IDs ref and send. I will talk the server. I will talk about the server implementation. A client process marshals the object ID, message, and its arguments to a server. Once the server receives this data, it has to transfer to appropriate objects. To do so, you need a way to uh, look up objects and transfer these methods. This is, this is where ID2Ref comes in. ID2Ref converts reference IDs into their associated objects. I guess you rarely use this method. Then send me method, <laughs> then the send method sends a message to an object. Once the object is found, then the RB server sends a message requested from a client to the object. I also need a few other techniques to make the RB behave Ruby. I behave like Ruby. Makoto will explain. So, so far easy, right? Yeah, you guys kept up to speed, yeah? I hope you guys can keep it up for the next one as well because I really struggled last night. Uh, I, this slide we just added uh, last night and then I spent three hours trying to understand what this really means. I, in the end, I was half crying like, Mr. Hexa, I don't understand. <laughs> then he just kept trying to <laughs> explain it to me. So, but I'll try my best and if it doesn't make sense, there's a Eric, or in the, there's also Matt who can help me explaining. So, uh, yeah, there's a one called, so there's three things. Uh, so how do you recover unknown objects? And the second is multi-threading, a bit more detail. And the third thing is 100 method call with block. So what do you mean by unknown objects? Uh, let me demo again. So the same terminal, top is one, bottom is two. In bottom two, you just define a class called foo, which has a method called bar. So if you do who dot bar, it just says bar. That's easy. But so what if you try to send this object to terminal one, which doesn't know anything about who class? So is it even possible? So let's see. Uh, do KBS foo, and it has foo object, and in the top, it's gonna happen. And it says now it says it's not called DRB unknown object. And uh, if you look at it, but it still have the name called foo, and it has a string in the buffer. If you uh, Excuse the method called bar, it, that, it says undefined method because it's like an unknown object, which is it's no bar. Okay, so what if I uh, redefine, can define a full class uh, on terminal one and uh, do it again? Still, it doesn't understand. But the Ruby has a method called reload, which kind of reload it and uh, regenerate the full object. So now, if you put that reloaded one into the object, you can see the bar. Easy, right? I think. <laughs> So what has just happened? 
So who did replace who with DRB and GNOME? Okay, let me try to explain. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so when in Terminal 2, try to uh, put the object into the hash, it do the Marshall dump, right? You learn that, right? Then, whenever you put it, the hash is owned by Terminal 1. So in this situation, Terminal 1 is a server. So when Terminal 2 dumps it, Terminal 1 loads it. And because it doesn't, the foo doesn't exist, it raises error called name error and argument error. That time, it's kind of similar to you know, the you know, reference one. When you try to uh, master it, it, you can't master it, so you replace it with the uh, reference object. It's kind of similar thing as here, it, does, it generates GRB unknown object. And what this one does is it just checks the uh, error string. And uh, it doesn't make you expression because there's no, there isn't, I think, way to actually say what's the name and method. So it just passes the error message and they put into the name and they put the same thing in the buffer. Okay, I think this is still okay. Uh, but what if, so now terminal one server doesn't have who object, but it does have DBL and no object. So if you terminal two try to call that object again, what happens? Because that object is not in terminal two, it's in terminal one. Is term, does terminal one returns this unknown object? Uh, the answer is, uh, it's simple, it just returns back the buffer. So every time it just returns back the, the serialized object. So in terminal two, when you lose it, uh, it just generates a, a few object again. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Silent? Yeah. Can you nod if you understand? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, so then next, so when you do the, uh, yeah, define the uh, who object in terminal one, I did a magic, magical method called reload. So what's inside? Uh, it's just actually Marshall load. It's the same pattern we, we use, like, you know, we, you try to load. If it, do, it does exist, it works. If, if it doesn't, uh, rescue it and uh, create a new DRB and no object. So if you actually see, uh, try to see that, you know, in a terminal one demo example, if you try to inspect every time you see the DRB and no object, but it actually gen generates new ID. Yeah, that must be me. <laughs> okay. I tried to clarify one thing, but he wasn't paying attention. Okay. Uh, so the second is uh, multi threading. Uh, initially, so he, he borrowed the pattern of the multi threading in socket programming from the Harasan sub, uh, Shinichiro Harasan server. What it does is uh, so when you DRuby acts as a server, if there's any incoming request, uh, you hold it one. But if you get other requests at the same time, uh, if it's single thread, uh, like, un un yeah, unless it's like event loop or anything, it kind of holds if you're processing something. So it spawns a new, uh, no, yeah, it generates a new thread. And uh, this is very important, especially this example. So imagine this is in terminal two. You are in a KBS, which is a hash. And if you do kbs.each and uh, you pass a block, what it's actually happening is when you do kbs.each, the kbs hash is in terminal one. So you're actually invoking the method of each in terminal one. But as soon as you try to evaluate block, that wasn't dumpable, so it has a reference. So it goes back to terminal two, and uh, it gets evaluated to the place where you, you ask the request. So let me explain another example. If you, that KVS is a like, large, yeah, big hash or something, and if you do the each, so every time you do the each, it, it goes to the terminal one, then it goes back, evaluate, then it goes and it goes back and evaluate. Then if it's, again, single thread, this, this communication causes a deadlock, but because you're using a multi-threading, that doesn't happen. That's how uh, DRuby is utilizing multi-threading. Okay, is it okay, Eric? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so that this is how it actually works. I think you already seen the similar uh, line of code in the method missing part, like it's doing the object dot send. But in this case, you are calling block dot call inside the block. Easy, right? This should work, right? Does this work? Yeah. Raise hand. Yeah, it's actually wrong. This <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you do this, you actually raise a, if, 
it works, but if you do the break inside the each block, it actually raises local jump error. Do, does this make sense? Yeah, because I really struggle to explain this one, but let me try my best. Uh, so inside, you know the control flow, like next or uh, break, if that is called, it goes outside, uh, yeah, it, it breaks from the current block, and it tries to go back to the environment you are in. That usually works if you just do a method invocation voice block in normal thing. But what it, it's happening is, you know, every time you are in the each and coming back, you having in a new thread, which is a completely new environment. So the environment where you did it is lost. Hence, there's nowhere to do the local jump. That's why it raises. Oh, you know, that, wow, amazing. It took three hours for me to understand, but <laughs> you did it in one, two minutes. Impressive, yeah. Actually, can I clap hands for him? Yeah. Thank you. That's really good. Thank you. So the workaround is once you understand, it's quite easy. All you do is that uh, you catch it and then you break by yourself. So yeah, once you understand, I think. Yeah. Did you get it? You know, that's <laughs> me crying. <laughs> like, ah, oh, please don't spare me to, you know, to anymore. And he, yeah, I, I find it good. So I get it. I think. So I'm very happy. So now I will pass it. Back to Sexton. I'm loading Makoto script. <laughs> Let me summarize what we have explained so far. First, I talked about the history of my programming pr patterns and how DRB was born. Then, I took you through various metaprogramming techniques behind DRB. You make it you may think programming is cool, uh, metaprogramming meta is, is cool, but I feel like some people are using metaprogramming as an end in itself, rather than as a tool. I use metaprogramming for deal with out of necessity, but try hard not to reveal it to the end users. However, if you look carefully, metaprogramming is everywhere. You may not even notice that uh, there is magic, but that's the most magical thing about it. I have explained everything you need to implement DLB. It's your turn now. Now you can write your own DLB. A cool one, please. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to say one thing about why you even need DLB undumped. Do you know why? <laughs> Anyone? So like something like render, like distributed tuple space, when you try to do from a client, one client, another trying to exchange object, uh, if, because it, DRuby relies on Marshall dump and load for everything, so if by the time render try to load that Marshall dump, it, ra it raises unless you have every single object clients gonna ever pass, pass in the future. This is a kind of ways to work way around us, so it works. So distrib it's distributed, but you can use it as like a central repository to pass object around. I think that was a very important things I wanted to explain. And now questions? Okay. There are some objects that can't be marshaled, right? Like a proc can't be marshaled. Yeah. Uh, yes. There's does DRuby have a way of managing those types of objects that can't be marshaled? Okay, uh, question was, so uh, Ruby cannot mar dump marshal dump some of the object and know how it works. That's a demo two example. So like I standard IO, you can't dump. So what it's doing is like it dumps, raises exception, catches it, and it just creates a new object which has a reference information of the IO object pass to the server. So when server, this server tried to execute it, it doesn't execute in uh, server, but it just goes back to the client, the client executes. So one of the first mistake, 
yeah, proxy, yeah. Part of the uh, first mistake I did was I thought, yeah, I can pass proc, so I can use distribute the processing thing to different processes. So I created those uh, proc and I send it, <laughs> and uh, I the I asked the remote ones to you know evaluate to use the CPU part and it goes back. What I was actually doing is like proxy back and actually client was processing everything. <laughs> you know, once you understand, it's like kind of silly, but yeah, you can uh, test it. Perfect example, if you try to do I.O. and if you try to do I.O. read, a file read or something, then you can see where you, ex and then, you know, you have a terminal in a different directory, then you know exactly where it's executing. That's a way, good, easy way to debug how the DRuby's behavior, that, and that's kind of where I learned. Uh, that it's called pass by reference compared to pass by value. Yeah, next question. Yes. Um, two questions. Yes. Uh, first, uh, does DRuby support uh, multiple topologies as opposed to single point to point? Or does it do like broadcast topology or maybe ring topology? And also, uh, what kind of security is there in DRuby? So, uh, first question is what kind of distribution topology DRuby supports? And the second one is what kind of security model it provides? Uh, No. <laughs> okay, so fundamental principle is like some of the distributed product try to be to solve the problem of distributed things. His his main motivation is he wants to create the object which just behaves like Ruby. Does Ruby have a broadcasting? Uh, no, so he, that's why he didn't implement. Okay, <laughs> maybe you can implement on top of it. I think. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, Rinda, uh, chapter, I think, six, seven? Yeah, seven of our DRuby book. <laughs> There's a fantastic uh, library called Rinda. You should definitely have a look. 40% yeah. uh, off now. Okay. <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> security model. Uh, Says no, <laughs> because <laughs> Ruby doesn't have it. Uh, but uh, I think you can use. There's a way to use SSH over, and that's the chapter 13 of the <laughs> Deep Ruby book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm making up the chapter number because I don't remember. But that's you know, I think second last chapter. There's a one. I actually w I was translating, but I didn't really half understand, but, so ho I hope you understand my translation. <laughs> yeah. And also taint, taint model, like, yeah, you know. Oh, ah, okay, Murakane-san, just to come to you. So he uses SSH solution, so he's gonna explain now. <laughs> Woo! Big hands to Murakane. English, English. <laughs> he just copied exactly the same way found in a DRuby book. <laughs> but there's a way to use it as a gateway uh, using SSH, so I think you must buy one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yes, are you asking questions? Oh, statement, yeah. There's also uh, SSL, DRB over SSL, so built-in. Oh, there's, if you, there's also a, uh, you can require DRB slash SSL, and I'm not sure if there's much documentation on that, but uh, there are references to it either on Google or on the Ruby Talk mailing list archives from several years ago. So you should be able to find information about both SSH and SSL, both in the book and um, old examples. Thank you, Eric. Any other question? Yes, again. Um, do you know any projects where DR DRuby is used uh, right now? I, I remember that there was a time where RSpec used it. I think he still uses it. As far as I remember, every time I'm on RSpec, if there's a one small warning says, like DRB is not enabled. But I think if you do, you can. 
Yeah, and the spoke also uses it. Yeah? And I thank God, you know, the monitoring one? Yeah, I think it, it uses it, I think. Yeah. There's also a Pry remote to use Pry. There's a version of it that you can use over the network that uses DRuby. Oh, really? So you can actually have a Pry console to a different oh, I use Pry, and they, like every time I talk about DRuby, they, people say, so what do you use it for? And I just realized I'm using it every day. So I'm very pleased about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes? some way to do uh, discovery of other DRuby? Discovery. In your uh, discovery. Uh, so question was, how do you do discovery service? The short answer is, uh, the, if you want to do it very simple way, hash is actually the discovery service. So one of the examples is like you. Name service or public service? Name service, or what you want to find out? Uh, so if, if you have multiple DRuby nodes out there, yeah. uh, any examples, you're, oh, you're, you're Ruby connecting. Ruby Ruby, yes. Yeah, so you're connecting to the URL directly, yeah. which you already know ahead of time. Yeah. Is there a way to discover your other DRuby nodes? Ring the ring finger. And the, you made one as well, wasn't it? Ring, ring. Yeah, you wrap it. OK, so yeah, so <laughs> yeah, uh, there's, a, there's one called ring finger. And uh, also, I think Eric had a wrapper because it's harder to use. I don't know. <laughs> Makes it more convenient to use. Yeah, so that's the one. Yes. Any, any other questions? Yes. There's also um, Spectre is an example of using Bonjour for discovering in Ruby. Oh. So you can use Bonjour. Is it a message I am or something? Bonjour is I am? Like a message and stuff? Bonjour is like DNS versus yeah. services between machines on the LAN. Okay. Uh, okay. Anything else? Good, okay, thank you.